Okay, so this question is about methods you use to time and why they're going to be more accurate or more reliable. Then there's a really quite a tricky drawing of a line of best fit and they're going to give you some difficult graphical skills. And then lastly, it's once more that idea of y equals mx plus c. Here again, being really familiar with those practicals is going to help you out. You will have done some kind of oscillation practical whereby you've had to measure a time period and that's what this question is all about. Um, it's basically acting like a pendulum look for the pendulum. Describe how you use a stopwatch to determine the value for t. So you don't try and do one swing, do you? You record um, at least five swings, so I would probably do 10. 10 full swings. Now I might want to put down, I'd use a marker at the equilibrium position so I could more easily tell when I was done 12 full swings, but we're just after the stopwatch here. Okay, so t 10 full swings, divide the time by 10. And what does this do? Well, this means that our percentage error, our percentage uncertainty of timing 10 full swings is less than our percentage uncertainty of timing one full swing. A swing is gonna be in the order of seconds so when we've got human reaction time to factor in, which is in the order of 0.1 of a second, then we've got much less of a percentage uncertainty if we time more um, swings. And they're really keen on that. If you can increase the value of what you're timing, the actual reading, the actual recording, then you can reduce your percentage uncertainty given the absolute uncertainty won't change. It's a core concept being assessed in this exam. Two reasons why repeating the readings will improve the results for T. So why should we do more repeats? Well, actually, this is good old spot anomalies. And also the fact that if you do that, you can calculate a mean which will reduce the effect of random human error. And again, why is that? It's due to human reaction time. Okay, I hope that makes sense. There's two nice two markers. Okay, so here's, they've done this experiment, plotting time against height. Okay, this is an in interesting pendulum because you've got a mass that which is above the end of it as well. So it has this interesting shape here. Um, so all they actually need you to do for one mark is just to draw a line of best fit. What I actually do when I'm drawing a line of best fit is I actually curve the paper so that my arm is acting more naturally as a curve. This is a technique from my art days. Okay, that allows me to be a bit more Kind of short, and we don't like to see hairy lines of best fit. So we don't like to, we like to see well-defined lines of best fit. So just be careful when you draw, draw those. The sharp pencil, takes up a rubber. Okay, now they're looking for in this, they're looking for the minimum being between here and here. Right, use your line to determine the value of H, which is the smallest value of T. So we're looking here for that minimum. The graph of t against h does not produce a straight line. The variables t and h are related by this, where c is a constant. Describe a graphical method to determine the value for c and state the unit for c. So I'm surprised, in a way, to not see this as being um, actually plot this. So, they, so often they give you data like this with a couple of blank columns and you have to work out what to plot and maybe I should go ahead and plot that. But essentially this is for just recognizing that this is y equals mx plus c. So you can do lots of different things. You're told that, well, you know in fact that 4 pi squared and g are constants. So you could put them on the x-axis but you might as well make them your gradient. So this would be your y your m somewhere in there, and your c is the y-intercept. So um, plot t squared h on the y-axis, and plot h squared on the x-axis. 
Okay, what will be the gradient then? The gradient is the coefficient of x, so 4 pi squared over g. All of that's constants. C is the, they want the graphical method to determine the value of C. C is the y-intercept. Very nice of them to use the same term there, just to really give it, uh, really make it obvious for us. Now, what is the y-intercept going to be? Well, it's going to have the same um, unit as the y-axis, because it's a y-intercept, so it has to, doesn't it? Well, the y-axis would have units seconds squared meters, okay? So I could put that in there. C would have units, meters, seconds squared. Interesting one. That is not a unit I'm used to seeing. So people are gonna be thinking, hmm, there should be a negative there. That's gonna trip you up. But trust the maths, work back through the rearranging and the equations that you've used. Maybe even sketch out a little graph if you're not completely sure. That is the unit there. So three marks, where to plot them, where C is, and what the units of C would be. Can you take an experiment that's been given you and work out a way to rearrange the equation into a y equals mx plus c format. We really like y equals mx plus c because it gives us a graphical average. If we can put a quantity we want to measure on an intercept or as a gradient, then we can get a graphical average, which is one of the most accurate ways to get our averages.